Good morning, Strasburg United Methodist Church and everybody who has found us here online, either on Facebook or YouTube. My name is Reverend John Haynes, and I'm the pastor of Strasburg UMC. I've been here a little over 10 years. And I just want to let you know that um, I'm sorry that I haven't been online since the end of November. My father-in-law passed away right after Thanksgiving, and my wife and I took a little time to grieve, and we had some other things going on. And now I'm just finally able to actually have some headspace to be able to do this in addition uh, to preparing for worship every Sunday. So I thank you for your patience with me. I'm glad that I could be back with you all. And I do invite any of you to come in person to worship here at 114 West Washington Street here in the wonderful town of Strasburg, Virginia. We're going to actually make it a little shorter this time with our worship service. I'm just going to have an opening prayer and then we're going to go immediately into our scripture and then the sermon. So again, we welcome you, glad that you're here, and I hope that you can come and join us sometime in person. Will you pray with me? God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may celebrate your glory and truly worship you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. And uh, we like to refer to these, this text from Paul as, as kind of like a, a, some, a rules for Christian ethics. And so I hope you hear them as such. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, the alternative to going to a movie theater to watch a film that you wanted to watch was to go to the, your local video store. Pay anywhere from 99 cents or to $4 and take home a video cassette. That was roughly about eight inches wide, one inch high and four inches deep. Now, some of you older folks know exactly what I'm talking about. You probably have some sitting in your garage or if you go to a thrift store, you may see them filling up all of the shelves. And, and one thing you'll notice and what you remember about going to the stores is that there was always a little sticker on the front of the register that said, please be kind, rewind. Or as the times went on and, and people were less kind or, or more forgetful, there was a, a 50 cent charge if the tape was not rewound and you'd be some, stuck with some surprise the next time you went into rent when you had all those things. Now, the VCR tape has long been relegated to boxes in the garage, to shelf space in thrift stores, or gathering dust in our cabinets. And we know that the DVD had a brief, brilliant, meteoric rise from the 90s and the early 2000s. But even that media has fallen by the wayside as we all have personal handheld video players called smartphones. Or, as many of us have discovered, on-demand videos from Hulu and Netflix and Amazon. And it's kind of funny, we're actually now paying about $6 for a movie. Now, I'm not ever arguing that we go back to that age. Uh, there was a time in the early 2000s that 4 or $5 a night was the going rate to rent a movie from Blockbuster. Now, you can find those same films in the bargain bin at Walmart for almost the same price. But I think about those bygone days, and I wonder if we've lost something. I think we've lost that opportunity to be considerate of another person. Yes, it was a pain 
for the video store owner to have to take all those video cassettes that people forgot to rewind and run them through the cassette rewinder. I can understand why 50 cents seemed to be a good charge for that. But do you remember the moment when you would get that video and be upset that you had to wait three minutes or so for your VCR to rewind the tape all the way to the beginning? And maybe it happened enough times that you became thankful that someone else wasn't careless. Maybe you thought, you know what, it really is kind to rewind the tape that I just watched at the beginning, just so another person could enjoy it without getting frustrated like I did. You see, kindness is the act of putting ourselves in another person's shoes. Kindness is a reminder that we ought to think about another person when making our own decisions and choices. Kindness is the act of opening our eyes and recognizing the needs of others and responding with compassion, concern, and care so that transformation may happen. Maybe you've heard about the theory of survival of the fittest. In the 19th century, as Charles Darwin was traveling the world, he would just watch the natural world around him and he was coming up with what we call evolutionary biology, this, this theory. And he coined the phrase, survival of the fittest. And what it meant, and what it's usually associated with, is selfishness. Meaning that to survive, which he recognized as a basic instinct of all life, means only to look out for yourself. But if you dig deeper into his theory, what you discover is that when Darwin studied human evolution, he argued that humankind was not motivated biologically to be that competitive or self-interested. We, we are no, no one is just an island. He said that we are profoundly social and caring as a species. And he argued that sympathy and caring for others is instinctual. And in fact, uh, 130, 150 years later, many psychological studies have reiterated this point over and over again. One article in Psychology Today states that science has now shown that devoting resources to others, rather than having more and more for ourselves, brings about lasting well-being. Kindness has been found by researchers to be the most important predictor of satisfaction and stability in a marriage. Many colleges, including Harvard, are now emphasizing kindness on their college applications how have you been kind? But like many things we are discovering in science and psychology, Jesus and the wise elders of the church understood this fact long, long ago. And you know what Christianity has been teaching it this whole time. When we go back to the actions and words of Jesus, we see our Savior continually aware of the needs of the world around him. Jesus is compelled to heal. He's compelled to break boundaries, to save the woman accused for, for adultery, to offer grace to the thief alongside him on the cross, to even cry out as the crowds gather underneath him, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing, right before he breathes his last. This awareness of the needs of others and the call to respond is even a part of the history of the early church. Immediately after Pentecost, we see the disciples appoint deacons to make sure that food and other resources are distributed to the poor, to the sick, to orphans and children and widows in the Christian church. During the Dark Ages and Middle Ages and the feudal systems that dominated Western civilization, the church continued to offer a counter-narrative to society that had healing and, and care for the widows and care for the children. And was it ever perfect? No, the church has never been perfect. But loving kindness is a value that even undergirds our modern society, even if we're not aware where it came from. When we turn to Paul, that great evangelist and founder of the churches, we see a man who gave us directions on what the Christian life should mean. 
We get lost, I think, sometimes in, in the places where he seemingly takes a side on, on one of the many issues of disagreement that we continue to fight about in our modern church. But we forget his constant refrain in, in all of his letters to the churches, that it's not about you. It's not just about your individual salvation or the way that you live your life. Paul calls us to remember that we are a part of a community, that we are members one of another. And he uses this great imagery of a body of Christ. In the great long description of spiritual gifts found in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And he tells us, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Kindness is remembering that our faith is about loving both God and our neighbor through our actions and our decisions. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul gives us a list of what I like to call Paul's Ten Commandments to the faithful. Paul says that if we are to call ourselves Christians, that we must first speak truth because we are all part of a common society. Second, be angry, but don't sin, and then let go of our anger. Number three, don't steal, make our work honest instead. Four, share, especially with those who need. And five, don't gossip, don't spout hateful language, build each other up. Number six, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, which I like to say is don't do things that will cause God to grieve over our spiritual death. Number seven, put away bitterness and wrath, anger, wrangling and slander and all forms of malice. And instead, we take up kindness. And this is number eight, be tenderhearted to forgive others as we have been forgiven by God. Nine, that we become imitators of God. And number 10, that we live in love. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. I could actually spend two and a half months just talking about each of these things separately. But today, I want us to remember kindness. Now, there are many in our society who think kindness is a sign of weakness. We can look at some business practices and we see that ruthlessness and deception and greed often are the motivating factors that get things done in our society. Even our politics has become a zero-sum game with the idea of some people being winners and others being losers and never having to compromise. You see this idea of the common good that many of us were raised with, which I define as the best that we can achieve for the most amount of people, is forgotten or neglected. Instead, we try to pursue only what's best for one person or one tribe or one type of person. When we look around in our society, we see people preying on the kindness of others. We hear stories of the young taking from the old or the rich from the poor. And we can be battered by that narrative in this world. We can become fearful and refrain from helping others, especially if we feel like we're going to be taken advantage of. But I've discovered that for us to be the type of people God calls us to be, to be people who practice kindness each and every day, that we must rely on the strength that God gives us to persevere and not just the strength that we already have. You see, it takes a strong and wise and patient and secure person to offer kindness consistently. And when we do not have the strength of character or the strength of will or the strength of family or friends or of a political party, we will fail. And so we have to rely on the strength of God. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Philippians that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we look at Paul, we understand he was a man that was beaten, who was tortured. He was imprisoned and chased and called many names. But despite all of that, he continued to preach a gospel that asks us to be kind. Being kind is the thing that will keep us living well in this uncertain life. And so my challenge to you in this uncertain world, in this anxious world we live in, 
maybe you and I need to rediscover the lessons of history. It's probably not going to be be kind, rewind, that, that's gone. But instead, it, it is something even more ancient and widespread and relevant even in this age. It's found in what we call the golden rule, a premise that's found in nearly every world religion. Do unto others as you wish to be done to you. Will you pray with me now? O oh Lord, despite our fear, despite our anger, Despite our insecurity, we offer ourselves to you. Be with us today. Teach us again how to have your eyes, your hands, and your mind when looking at others in our world. Give us enough grace that we can act with kindness. And Lord, may we every day become more like you. Amen. All right, my friends, you go in peace to love God, to love your neighbor. Amen.